Today is the first Sunday in Advent, and for some of you that have not heard of Advent or don't know what it is, the first Sunday of Advent, we look forward to the second coming of Christ. The candles on the Advent wreath, as you can see, three are purple and one is pink, and there's one in the middle. The, the first candle reminds us of hope. The second candle is peace. The pink candle, generally lit on the third Sunday of Advent, represents joy. And the fourth candle is to mean purity, and sometimes we use a fifth candle, which in, is in the middle, the white one. It is called the Christ candle, and that is lit on Christmas to remind Christians of the light Jesus brings to the world. So, our announcements for this week. Uh, there are still several families in our congregation that are in need of help at this time. You can mail your check into the church with love offering written on the memo line. A virtual Advent Bible study started today, and this will be in place of Sunday school. It starts at 9.15 and will take approximately four weeks to complete. The study is called Incarnation by Adam Hamilton, and the book is available in large print. You don't have to have a book to participate in this study. If you would like to join, please call or email me in the office if you would like a book. The Scouts have offered again this fall to help anyone with outside chores, like leaf raking, picking up sticks, whatever. So you can contact me in the office for that also. We are looking for people to participate in worship, liturgists, Advent readers, etc. Please contact me in the office. Now we'll have an Advent reading by Chris and Steve Dalton. the ages, God's people have longed for a righteous ruler who will speed the day when God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We light the first Advent candles as hopeful citizens of God's kingdom, awaiting the arrival of the Anointed One. Jesus, you are King. Will you join us in prayer? God most high, our differences and disagreements to be your son's followers. May your spirit so fill our minds and hearts as we worship, worship you, that we will come to understand and embody what it is meant to be welcome. Jesus the Messiah, to praise him and to follow him as the King of Kings and the Prince of Holy prophets, God promised of old to save us from our enemies, from the hands of 
of all who hate us. To show mercy to our forebears and to remember the holy covenant. This was the oath God swore to our father Abraham, who set us free from the hands of our enemies, who is to worship without fear, holy and righteous in the Lord's sight all the days of our lives. Hail to the Lord from Rosie, great David, David's son. And you, child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare the way, to give God's people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins, and the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Hail to the Lord's anointed, great David's greater son. everybody. Um, we are so glad that you have chosen to worship with us this morning. We want to um, thank you for patience with our technology as we continue to uh, work through some of the situations that we have. Um, praise God that we have technology and goodness gracious sometimes it's a challenge. Uh, we uh, want to thank those of you who were able to come out last week after the service was over, um, we just had a few people here, and we all wore masks, and and they did a beautiful job decorating. I'm going to tell you, I did a lot of walking back and forth and looking at the directions and shrugging my shoulders. Um, thankfully, the Daltons and Wilma Clark and my husband um, and Chris Todd were all here to help decorate, and so through the service, we are going to try to have the camera in uh, position so that you can see the different things. Um, but as you can see, the altar area is, is decorated beautifully and we have these lovely red poinsettias and then we also have these beautiful white poinsettias. I don't know if you guys notice the significance. See the trinity of the white poinsettias. Aren't they gorgeous? The huge one in the middle, um, I'm going to say that probably is going to celebrate the birth of Jesus our King. And we're going to talk about Jesus our King in a little while. But then the other two for the Father and the Holy Spirit. So um, thank you to all of you who spent time to help us make the, the sanctuary look more beautiful. To those of you who purchased the poinsettias, some of you we know and some of you are anonymous. Um, but we thank each of you for the ways that you help to enrich our worship service. As Chris mentioned, we do look for people who can help with the service. Uh, we will have an Advent reading each week, and we will do other things. We are hoping to have some special music and other, uh, other things that will enrich this time during Advent. So if there is something that you think you would like to be involved in, I hope that you will call the office or email either Chris or me and let us know how you might want to uh, enrich this service uh, during this time of Advent. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, at this time, we are going to have a, um, Jeremy, are we gonna have a hymn now? We're going to have a hymn. We're going to have a hymn, and we're going to let you guys sing a couple of verses at home. And the screen is going to show you the words um, so you can sing along. <laughs>
of faith, and today I've chosen the Nicene Creed. As we've talked about in uh, past weeks, we know that the Nicene Creed is the very oldest um, affirmation of our faith. I think it, it so, so concisely lets us share what we believe. So will you join me at home and read, uh, read along with me? We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. At this time in our service, we are going to move into a time of prayer. wanted to share a few prayer concerns and, and joys. Um, what a joy that we just got through the Thanksgiving season, and now it's time to start that Christmas music playing. Uh, many of you have already put up your decorations, and it's a good thing since we have snow in the forecast tomorrow that we will have our yards and our homes so beautifully decorated and not have to wrestle with that in, in the really cold uh, weather that's coming up. So glory be to God for beautiful lights and Christmas decorations that cheer our hearts and remind us of what's to come during the Christmas season. We have people in our, in our congregation and in our community who are ill, who, are, um, who have COVID right now and who are uh, recovering from it, some more quickly than others. And, and sadly, we also have folks that we know who we have lost to, to COVID, as well as, as people that we've lost due to other, other things. And so we keep those people in our hearts and in our prayers. I did want to mention um, another announcement um, by way of a prayer request. Um, this Wednesday evening, we are going to have another session of the Surviving the Holidays program. This is a program that is, is created by Grief Share Organization, and it is a two-hour seminar. We will do that with Zoom, and so it's very easy. You can um, do that off of your computer or your phone, and if you have any questions and you would like to participate in that two-hour program as we talk about uh, grieving the loss of a loved one, whether that person just died a few weeks ago or whether that person may have passed away years ago, but how we move into the, the, the season um, of Advent and, and look toward Christmas and, and have in balance the, the grief that we have for that one that we've lost. So if you are interested in participating in that, I hope that you will let us know and I can connect you so that you can be in that grief with us Wednesday night. We do pray for all of those who have lost loved ones in past weeks and in past months um, during this pandemic. Everything is harder, every single thing, and grieving uh, uh, the loss of a loved one is even harder. We, we have not gotten to do that in a way that we are used to, that, that provides comfort to us and provides the community that we need. And so I uh, want us to remember those people in our prayers this morning who are dealing with loss. Will you close your eyes and, and bow your heads and go with me to God in prayer now? 
Gracious God, we do thank you for this day, and we thank you that we are moving into the time of the year, Advent, the looking toward the coming of your Son. Father, that is such a hard, hard concept to even grasp, that you would send your own Son, God actually with us, in the form of a baby, and help us as we go through these weeks to take the time to read and to pray and to study what these really confusing and huge theological concepts mean to each of us. Lord, we live in a fallen world, and things around us are not as we wish they were sometimes. We pray for our country. We pray for our nation's leaders. We pray for this time of transition as we move toward uh, new people being in office in, in different government positions. Father, we, we pray blessings on all of them, whether they're the people we voted for or not. They will be our leaders, and we will, uh, we will lift them in prayer, as you have, have reminded us that it's our responsibility to do. Father, we pray for those who are sick, those who are recovering from illness, and those who will be going into the hospital this week for surgery and procedures. Lord, you're the great physician, and we just pray that you give a special blessing to everyone who is undergoing any kind of med medical procedure this week this week. And now we join together and pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. <clears throat> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, <clears throat> thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, uh, we are going to do our virtual offertory. Um, I want to tell you that if you are a member of this congregation, I want you to do this right now. I want you to pat yourself on the shoulder because you have been so faithful to this church um, in the time that I've been here in this whole year, at a time when more often than not, the doors have not even been open and you could not sit in these pews, um, you have continued to, to support this church financially. And, and I just want you to know, when I talk with my clergy colleagues, everybody does not have that experience. And I thank you that you realize that the ministries of this church continue. And I thank you so much for your faithful generosity. Um, at this point, since we do not take up an offering in the room, um, you can mail your, your offering in if you'd like to do that. You can use our online platform, and since Chris and I are in the office through the week, if you would like to stop by and drop that off, we would, um, we would be happy to see you and take that. Um, so I thank you again for the generosity that you have shown and the ways that you continue to support the things that we do here at Bloomington United Methodist. Church. Will you pray with me again? During this season of waiting and anticipation, we are reminded to stay awake for the coming of your Son. Jesus' love often comes into our life, lives in quiet, unexpected ways. Today, we generously respond to this compassion and commit ourselves to living in a manner worthy of your love. In anticipation of the coming of Jesus the Savior, we pray. Amen. The scripture this morning is from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 through 7 in the New Revised Standard Version Bible. If you would like to take a few minutes to look it up in your Bible or on the Bible app on your cell phone. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest. 
as people exult in dividing plunder. With the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For all the boots of the tramping warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. try every microphone in this building until I find one that likes me this morning. I think I've hit it. So, we just finished a five-week long study in the book, A Disciple's Path, and I hope that as we moved through that, that that bless, was a blessing to you as we looked at what it means to be a United Methodist and what it actually means just to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And I'm glad that's over with. It was, um, it was very interesting to me and, and helped me distill some things that, that, um, that I'm just not real clear on. So I hope it, I hope it gave you some, some moments of thought as well. And so today we begin a four-week study and we are going to be loosely following Adam Hamilton's book, Incarnation. For those of you who are not familiar with Adam Hamilton, uh, he is the senior pastor at Resurrection uh, Church, United Methodist Church in the Kansas City area. And that is the very largest United Methodist Church in the entire country. So he is the king of all Methodist kings. Uh, he is also a really great Bible study writer. He is a prolific writer. I believe he's written about 25 books, and most of those are studies. Some of you may have done some of those studies in the past. Uh, one of the ones that I've done that I really enjoyed is called Christianity's Family Tree, and it looked at how uh, our, our different denominational paths have broken off through the years and how we all really are so much more similar than we may realize from time to time. So uh, I encourage you, if you would like to join us in the Sunday school portion, because I'm really, I'm, I'm not sure how this is going to work out because we are doing a Sunday school lesson on this material and then I'm going to preach on this material. And I'm gonna try really hard to make sure that those two do not mirror each other so that the people in the Sunday school lesson don't get bored and say, I'm not going to church because I just heard that. Um, so if I repeat myself, those of you who were in Sunday school with me, um, you know, just, just remind me of that later and I'll, I'm gonna try to, try to keep things as uh, flowing without too much uh, duplication of effort. So this book, Incarnation, subtitled Rediscovering the Significance of Christmas, uh, by Adam Hamilton, and, and in his introduction, I'm just not even going to try to paraphrase it, I'm going to basically read a few sentences from his introduction that will give you an idea about this book and the direction that we're going. Hamilton says he hopes to explore the why and the what end questions of the Incarnation. Why would God come to us in Jesus? What was the purpose of the Incarnation? How are we meant to respond to the Incarnation, to God's coming to us in Jesus, today? And by answering these, we will hopefully indeed rediscover the significance of Christmas, the celebration of the Incarnation. And the way that we're going to do that is we are going to look at the names of Jesus. Today, we are going to look at his royal titles and what it means to call Jesus King. Next week, 
we will look at Jesus as Savior and why we even need saving. The following week, we will look at Emmanuel, God with us, and why that matters even today. And then finally, we will wrap up with this on the 20th, looking at Jesus as the Word and the light of the world. So that's what we're going to be talking about for the next four weeks. In this first chapter of his book, Hamilton entitled it Presidents and Kings. And he mentioned something that I wonder as well. Do you think it's a coincidence that our federal elections are held just a few weeks before Advent? It's been a tough year in a lot of ways, and boy, the political climate has just been more divisive than I can ever remember. And I've watched a lot of divisive election years. I wonder if, if it's just right before Advent so that after all of the, the stress and the drama of the election cycle is over with, we're able to kind of sit back and, and come and, and, and think, okay, it's time to come together now. It's time for us to focus on, on our king. There was a quote that Hamilton shared in his book. Would to God that all the party names and unscriptural phrases and forms which have divided the Christian world were forgotten, and that we might all agree to sit down together as humble, loving disciples at the feet of our common master to hear his word, to imbibe his spirit, and to transcribe his life into our own. Do you know who wrote that? John Wesley wrote that in 1755. So friends, we may think that this is the most divisive election season that we've seen, but in order for John Wesley to have written that in 1755, I'm thinking this might not, been, might not have been the only bad election cycle. So let's talk about Jesus as King, as Messiah. You know, a couple of the Gospels talk about Jesus' birth. And in Matthew, chapter 1, verse 18, it starts with, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. And then it talks about it. And then, also, the, the story of Jesus' birth in Luke 2, when the angels have appeared to the shepherds, beginning in verse 10, says, But the angels said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy to all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you you will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. So what is that word, Messiah? You know I love words, and I love to dig into them. So Messiah means anointed one. And what is anointed? To be anointed means to be set apart. Things and people have been anointed for a very long time. As far back as in Exodus, beginning with verse 25, Moses is told by the Lord first how to make this anointing oil, and there's a very precise description of that. And, and Moses has been told by the Lord, make these into a sacred anointing oil fragrant blend, the work of a perfumer. It will be the sacred anointing oil. Then use it to anoint the tent of meeting, the ark of the covenant law, the table and all its articles, the lampstand and its accessories, the altar of incense, 
the altar of burnt offering, and all its utensils, and the basin with its stand. You shall consecrate them so they will be most holy, and whatever touches them will be holy. Anoint Aaron and his sons, and consecrate them so they may serve me as priests. Say to the Israelites, this is to be my sacred anointing oil for the generations to come. Do not pour it on anyone else's body, and do not make any other oil using the same formula. It is sacred, and you're to consider it sacred. So, thousands of years ago, God said, I want to set these things apart. The things that he has given such specific directions as to how to create, to be used in the worship of him, he has then directed, anoint these things, set them apart. They're not going to be things that are used, these tools, these basins, these all of these things are not going to be everyday items. They are set apart. They are holy. And, and after he had Moses anoint all of these items, then he anointed the priests who performed all of these sacrifices. And you remember back in Exodus, all of those pages and pages and chapters and chapters about all of the different sacrifices and, and all of the rules and, and, and we're not going to get into that right now. But all of, all of those priests who followed those rules were anointed. They were set apart as well. The priests, the prophets were anointed and then finally when the people said, God, we need a king. We want to, we want to be like everybody else. We want to be like these other nations and we want a king. Now, I think God was, uh, based on the scripture, I don't think God was thrilled about that because God wanted to be their king. But they wanted a human king. And so he said, okay. And he anointed the kings. And we watched three times that, uh, that the king was anointed and he was set apart. And we believe, reading these scriptures, that God said, I'm going to work through you as a king to govern the people. Now, we also know when we read in the Old Testament that every king did not follow those rules and did not do what God wanted him to do. But there is one king who we think of as the perfect example in the Old Testament of a king. And he is one of my favorite, favorite Old Testament gods. And that is King David. In, in the book, Incarnation, Hamilton refers to him as the ideal pattern of a king. You know, the irony is, King David made some terrible choices in his life. He did things that did not glorify God, and he did things that he had severe consequences for, even losing his own child um, as a consequence for some of his actions. But he was also called a man after God's own heart. And I don't know about you, but that gives me a lot of hope that when I don't always make the very best decisions, and I do things that may have consequences, God knows my heart. And he is, he is able to work in and through those of us who, who sometimes don't make the great choices, but still love him. The passage that Chris read from Isaiah, which I will tell you um, as I prepared for the sermon, um, I don't know, many of you have heard that, that scripture, and I've always thought that it was written to tell about the coming of Jesus. And I did not realize until I prepared this week that originally that scripture had nothing to do with the birth of Jesus um, on, on, the, on, the, on the top level. It was about a completely different king, a completely different time, and that was about 600 years before the birth of Jesus. You may have heard me say before that I love to read the Bible because that is, it's the living word and that it is 
it is relevant in the time that it happened and it's relevant today. And over the years, that passage, even though it was originally written about a completely different situation, has come to, to, to be understood as a proclamation of that coming king. And he talks about things that are attributes that we should expect from a king or from, from a leader. He talks about growing authority. He talks about him having, uh, bringing endless peace. Oh, that we have endless peace. That we would have justice. Fair treatment for everyone, regardless of their position or their power, regardless of their skin color or who they worship as God even, whether they are poor or whether they are wealthy, but fair treatment for everyone. Another attribute is righteousness protection of those who are weak, the protection of those who are unable to protect themselves. Those are great, great attributes of a king and of a leader. And then another one, from that time on, even forever, this kind of everlasting rule cannot be achieved by just power or wealth. It requires God's help, and that in turn requires that the ruler rule in justice and in righteousness. So David was this perfect example of a king, and the people were told in Israel that, that David, as the perfect king, was an example there would be a king that came after him that would that would reign forever and in 2 Samuel 7 you'll notice I'm reading a lot of scripture this morning um, just there, there's so much to, that, that needs to fit into this story um, in 2 Samuel in chapter 7 God spoke to David through the prophet Nathan, and he said to David, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. And he goes on, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus was born, David was told that one of his descendants would rule forever. Forever. And then, 900 years went past. Do you think people gave up? Do you think they lost their hope? I think they might have. We know that there were, there were times, long periods of time, when people didn't even hear from God. Sometimes we give up on him too. We think he's not listening just like those people thought for all those hundreds of years that there would be no king that would come. We pray and we pray. We cry and we beg. We pray for justice and we pray for mercy. We pray for a lot of things that we don't like to talk about. We pray that that marriage is revived that that cancer goes into remission. We pray for that prodigal daughter to come home. We pray for an organ donor for that family member who needs it so desperately. We pray for the addiction to just come under control. 
all. We pray and we pray, and sometimes we just think God's not listening. But he was, and he is. These people lost their hope, and yet God was still at work through all of those years, even when long periods of time went by. And, and the people thought that they were just living in darkness. He was working, and he is working today. One of the things that I love about God so much, and yet that I struggle with, one of those theological concepts that I really grapple with, is that God does not live in space and time with us. He is outside of our space and our time. And we know that while it sometimes feels like we pray and we pray and we beg and we work and we struggle and we feel like God is not with us, his timing is perfect. And it's so frustrating when we don't understand it. But at a time when we have such instant gratification, um, I want to have a Sunday school class and we can't be together and I just click on the Zoom app, boom, there it is. I've got my class before me and we can hear and see each other and we can even watch a video. That is instant gratification. If I need something at home, I can click on Amazon and it is going to be here maybe even this afternoon, but probably it will take all the way until tomorrow. That is instant gratification, my friends. We are not living in a time when we are used to waiting and understanding God's time and God's purpose for some of the things that we go through. These people waited. They waited for a ruler to save them. And they hoped. They hoped and they prayed they struggled with bad leaders and great they, they, they lived in great times of good leaders we've had great leaders and we've had ones that are not so great and, and sometimes the ones that we think are great and not great are different depending on which side of the aisle we sit on maybe even which side of the aisle in this church I don't know, never checked but it's possible But for us, a child is born, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. What are you hoping for? What are you praying about? Is it that child that just won't job that just won't turn around? Is it that relationship with a friend that's broken that feels like it's gone? What do you hope for? Jesus, our King, the one who's been set apart, the one who's been who was anointed, the one that was hoped for for almost a thousand years, came. And he came to us as a baby. Not very kingly, it feels like. A little baby born to a teenager in a place where animals were fed. don't understand.
understand and we wait because we know that they are coming. As we move forward into the coming weeks and we look at different names for, for Jesus, I wanted to share a clip and um, in, our, in our Sunday school lesson, Adam Hamilton talks about this clip and this clip is, is from a sermon by a pastor named S.M. Lockridge. Now, S.M. Lockridge, I believe, was destined to be a pastor because S.M. stands for Shadrach, Meshach, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from Daniel. He was going to be a pastor. He was born um, nearly 100 years ago. He was the father of a pastor and went to college, was an English teacher, and then he became a pastor. He felt that call and he became a pastor first in Texas where he was from and then he pastored um, a large Baptist church in San Diego, California for I believe it was about 40 years before he passed away in 2000. And one of his most famous sermons was a sermon called um, He's My King. And there are clips on YouTube uh, that have just a few minutes of this, and we are going to try to play this. And for those of you um, who have watched us online, you know that sometimes Facebook Live takes issue with things that may or may not be copyrighted. Um, I, and I'm hoping that I'm saying enough of the right words that we won't get um, muted out. But if that does happen, I would invite you to go to YouTube and the Bible, the Bible says. The Bible says he's a king of the Jews. He's a king. Okay. And now we're gonna start, we're gonna start it. It's called He's the King. Of Israel. He's a king of righteousness. He's a king of the ages. He's a king of heaven. He's a king of glory. He's a king of kings, and he is the Lord of Lords. That's my king. Do you know him? No means of measure can. Find his limitless love. Well, well, he's in journalist form. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's impartial priest. He's imperial power. And he's impartially much. Do you know him? He's God's son. He's a sinner saint. He's a centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented, for he's the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's a fundamental doctrine of true theology. Do you know him? He survives strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges death. He delivers the captives. He defends the people. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he beautifies the meek. Do you know him? My king is a king of knowledge. He's a wellspring of wisdom. He's a dope way of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. He's a gateway of glory. Do you know him? His life is massive. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. I wish I could describe him for you, but he, he didn't describe him. He didn't describe him. Yeah. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. You can't get him out of your mouth. You can't get him off of your head. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him.
that you were here to worship with us uh, through the miracles of technology and I just pray God's richest blessings on you as you go out into the world to do the will of Jesus. God bless you all. Amen. <laughs>